Attention all you rule breakers, you misfits and troublemakers, all you free spirits and pioneers, all you visionaries and nonconformists. Everything the establishment has told you is wrong with you is actually what's right with you. You see things others don't. You are hardwired to change the world. You are listening to the Spiritual Activist Radio Show, and I am Rahasia Uncensored where we look at the world not as it is, but as we know it can be, if and only if we have the courage to question the answers we've been given. This is our world, and it's time for us to take it back. My wife and I were invited to have dinner and spend the evening with David Icke, and I was able to have an incredible conversation with him about breaking out of the matrix and what keeps us unknowingly enslaved. He gave me what I have come to see as a very important piece of advice, which was nothing absolutely nothing is as it seems to be. If you want to hear more about David Icke and go a little bit further down this rabbit hole, you can visit David at www.davidike.com. You know, there's a few things I'd like to talk about before we get into the interview with David Icke. Between publishing a magazine called The Lotus Guide and having the Rahasia Uncensored segment on the Golden Road television show, Some of my friends have been wondering why I would even take on another project like this radio show. The short answer is simply this. I feel we are approaching times that could be called the best of times and the worst of times. Now that being said, I think each and every one of us need to speak out to our circle of influence about the world we live in and give a voice to others who might have something to say from their particular perspective. There are people waking up all over this planet right now to the injustice that many of us are feeling. But what's really changing is that there are so many people wanting to do something about it, like David Sereda, who was one of my first interviews for this show. This is also a venue where we can all step out there into an unknown territory where science fiction merges with fact. We have been indoctrinated and programmed to the point to where if you even say the words secret space program, UFO, or conspiracy, you get a smirk and an uplifted eyebrow. But this is usually from people who simply have never looked into the mountains of evidence that confirm these stories. I still hear people say things like, if UFOs were real, the government could never keep it a secret. Eh, well, after a few seconds of dealing with the naivety of their statement, I would usually say, well, you're absolutely correct. That's why it's not a secret anymore. There are high-level military personnel speaking out, and many of the astronauts are finally talking about what they've observed in space. And where do you think all the trillions of dollars have gone? Money doesn't disappear. It gets spent on secret programs. So the Spiritual Activist Show is about taking action on a spiritual conscious level to make lasting changes because the civilization we live in is unsustainable and we all need to think out of the box that we've been born into. I set this show up as a nonprofit, which means it's a community supported show with no advertisements, so I would never be obliged to or influenced by advertisers. Having a free independent media has always been our safeguard against tyranny and the eventual tiptoe to the totalitarian government, as David Icke would say. It's all a matter of perspective. When I look at the world through the eyes of some of my friends and acquaintances, when they talk about the world they see looming on the horizon, I see a dark landscape with collapsing environments, depopulation programs, and starvation of billions of people. But what they see is a virtual hell. And what I see is a landscape of infinite possibilities for us adventurous spirits who have the courage to take action and know that we all have the divine spark of creation within us that allows us the ability to create and envision a new reality. Now, let's listen to David Icke and see what he has to say today. Okay, Dave, first of all, David, I have to tell you, this is really a pleasure for Dara and I. Ah, no problem, no problem at all. Nice to meet you. Yeah. We really respect. Do you want to pull that chair over there? Are you going to record this? Yeah, you are yeah. recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what that camera's doing, isn't it? Yes, see, it so is. so sharp the way I'm observing. You can that right yeah. up. Amazing. Okay. Okay, David. Um, 
And then once in a while I'm gonna take a picture. Okay, that's not a problem. Okay. The camera can stand it, I can. Okay, for, first question is pretty easy when you're poor young, sure. In your new book, what do you mean by get off your knees? Well, it's funny because uh, the, the title came to me um, about a year ago, Human Race, Get Off Your Knees. Um, I was putting a talk together and I, I, did, I was doing this sequence about how people acquiesce to authority, acquiesce to belief systems. And I kept putting these pictures together and everyone was on their bloody knees, basically, in different ways, but often literally on their knees. And I thought, you know, that, that's the thing, we are on our knees. And it's another interesting thing that I noticed that um, to, put, to have your head in the sand, you have to be on your knees. Physically, you have to, but not just physically, mentally and emotionally. Um, and uh, getting off your knees is also getting, getting your head out of the sand and looking around and seeing what's happening as opposed to what you're told is happening, where most people get their perceptions from. But what I found is that it's really struck a chord. Not just, yes, human race, get off your knees, but people thinking, hold on a second, I am on my knees, aren't I? You know, I get up in the morning and I go to work and I'm stuck in that place. I can't leave until I'm, I'm allowed to leave. And then I get stuck in a traffic jam on the way home. My kids get up in the morning. They go to school. They can't go out of that place. They're in prison as well all day. They're told what to do all day, just as I have to do what I'm told all day. Um, and, 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 and that we call this life. Um, I am on my knees. And... It's like in the, in the Matrix movie where it's like the first step to freedom is realizing you're not free. That's the real first step. Because we have systems uh, all over the place that is designed to make us feel we're free. And we have a say in things, like we have a vote. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, my, my view is everyone to their own. Don't vote, it only encourages them. Because the, the people that um, are demanding our votes to have at least some level of power over us, um, have no contract with us whatsoever. They can say what the hell they like, which is what, what they think we want to hear. They then get voted into power. There is no contract whatsoever to then fulfill what they said they ha are going to do for our support. And, and, and we, it's like we're in this period now of, of where, where it's becoming more and more blatant. I, I, I learned 20 years ago now, when I first started to wake up, that there was a vibrational change coming. It was the first things I realized through various means. And I, my first book was called Truth Vibrations, which was named after this vibrational change. And what I, what I was told was this vibrational change was going to awaken people from there mass hypnotic state and also was going to bring to the surface all that had been hidden so that we could see what we couldn't see before now all that's clearly uh, happening and, and, and an expression of that is that things are becoming more blatant and what I'm talking about here is is Barack Obama because you had a person whose whole um, whole approach, whole um, sales pitch for over a year was change, change, changing. He never said what it was, because if it had gone into detail, he wouldn't have probably got elected. But um, by, by, by making himself a blank screen, change, change, people were able to project upon him what they perceived that change was. He allowed himself to become all things to all people. Where I'm going with this, however, is that it was so blatant, so extreme, change, 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 that people genuinely thought they were making a difference by voting for some kind of change. Now, what's happened is it's business as usual. It's just another version of Bush. Why? Because if you go from Bush and Obama up a little bit, you find the same people. And what's kind of encouraging for me is um, when you see where Obama was in November 2008, you'd think his honeymoon period would go on for years. It didn't. It was going down very, very quickly into 2009. 
And so people are beginning to see um, and, and see through the illusions of choice, the illusions that they, they, they can make a difference because um, you live in a free country which is dictated by the people. These things are starting, and, and in America of course, even more than Britain and Europe, although we've had some of it there, Americans, um, right, right the way from the uh, creation of the country, have been bombarded generation, generation, generation about this is the land of the free, this is the freest country in the world. And when I first came here and I kept hearing this, I kept thinking, well, why do, do the authorities have to keep telling Americans how free they are? Shouldn't it be bloody obvious? And I saw things, my, my country is kind of diabolical in terms of freedom now, Britain, but and that's my country, it's where I was born, it's where I live. But um, the um, I came to America to really started to travel in 1996, and, and, and I, I, I couldn't believe how unfree it was compared with what, what we, we were told. But it's all subliminal. It's been subliminal, subliminal, subliminal. What it's, what's happening is becoming conscious in more and more people. And, and that, this is great because the first stage is, hey, I'm not free, am I? Hey, I am a slave, am I? Hey, I am on my knees, am I? And that's the first stage. And that's when you choose, which pill am I going to take? Am I going to stay being like that? Or am I going to say, not only stage one, I realize I'm a slave, two, I ain't having it. And that stage is starting to move. And you're going to be amazing years, amazing years coming up. The next six, six seven years, fantastic challenges, amazing transformations for the better. Yeah, you know, I, to quote Einstein, he said, we will never solve problems from the same level of consciousness that created them. And as I look at the world we live in, and the people who appear to be making the decisions, it does indeed appear that we are making it worse with every solution we come up with. Could it be that we have simply constructed a civilization that is unsustainable and needs to collapse? It needs to collapse, um, yes. And, and, and what Einstein said is patently obvious when you look at the political system. In every country, you have political parties. Now, why did they create political parties? Because if we had a society in which people, if, if we had political systems as we do now, um, put themselves forward as individuals based on their own attitudes, their own beliefs and what they want to do, that would create hundreds and hundreds of people in Congress that had no uh, point of connection or coordination. The coordination would be, you want this change in society, okay, that's fine. Now you've got to persuade these individual minds that that's a good thing. Instead, they create political parties because they're controllable. So like in Britain and, and, and America, uh, in Britain we have things called whips in the, in the political parties. And these whips um, are, 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 uh, are named after a, um, or maybe it's, it's the other way around, whatever. If a, if a party, whether it's in government or opposition, um, wants to either bring in legislation or oppose it, the, the, um, they send out... Um, communications to all their members of parliament in that party and a, a, a one underline is a one line whip that means we'd like you to vote the, the way we're telling you to vote two line whips we'd really like you to vote this way three line whips you do want a political career don't you you know and 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 so because of that if you want to progress in a political party then you have to basically serve the party hierarchy so you'll progress. And if you're a rebel, well, you won't. And most people, they, they put personal power and progress, as they see progress, above doing what they know to be right or believe to be right. Through this structure, you've got basically um, different uh, groups, different constructs called political parties, which can be made overwhelmingly to move as one unit. So the top can dictate how the rest of it moves. So now already 
you're in a situation where a tiny few people at the top of the hierarchy of the party are dictating how that party votes uh, and, and responds in political debate. Now, now, if you want legislation through, you've not got to uh, get um, hundreds of, of individual minds to see that actually it's good for the people. All you've got to do is get the hierarchy to dictate to the party uh, uh, structure that you're all going to vote for this or else. And um, these structures, whether they're called Democrats or Republicans, Labour or Conservative, whatever, are the same consciousness. I've been, I've been, I was in politics in the Green Party for a short time, if you can call that politics, and I saw that this Green Party in Britain, or as a national spokesman for a few years, um, claimed to be different. It had a different colour, it had a different name, it said it was coming from a different point of view, and I saw that it was a blueprint, a blueprint, a political blueprint. It's like a vibrational um, uh, resonance. And, and, and all these different parties call them the same vibrational resonance. So what you do is you replace the Republicans, who, who have a certain level of consciousness, with the Democrats, who are pretty much the same level of consciousness. They, they uh, make a pig's ear of it. These come in saying, we'll put it right, but they're the same level of consciousness as them. So they make a bigger pig's ear of it, and then these come in because of that bigger pig's ear, and, they, and, and so it goes on. And, and this is why this consciousness shift that we're going through, it's going through, more and more people are anyway. And it's really going to gather in the next uh, six to ten years, big time, um, is so vital. Because unless we have a shift of consciousness um, and uh, we move our point of observation of things, then nothing's going to change. Because any, any what we call world is always a collective reflection of the collective level of awareness and consciousness of the people. And we've, we've been through a period of incredibly st stupid um, levels of what we call consciousness. Um, and, you know, the, the inmates have taken over the asylum. <laughs> They're called politicians and bankers and all this stuff. Now we've got a chance to move on. But you're absolutely right. The, if this system does not collapse, it will, of course, suffocate at birth anything... We've seen it happen. Anything trying to get in. And it needs to crash. Um, and this is why those who started to awaken a bit are the lucky ones, really. Because they can at least see... That, that this has to go before something better can come in. Um, what people who are still stuck in what I call five sense reality, which is still the majority, they're not going to see that. They're going to see that. All hell's breaking loose in the world. What's going on? It's going to be very challenging for them. I, I think one of the things that's important is if our civilization is falling, like every other civilization in the past has done, then I almost see this as an opportunity because if it's going to fall, maybe we should do a controlled demolition. And that's almost what I see people like you doing, is like, if this thing has to fall, why not control it while we still have some infrastructure to start rebuilding a new society in a new, new kind of a way? That's a very good point. Um, we're at a point now where it's kind of funny, it's like, there's different levels of looking at the same thing. Uh, I have to I have a snigger to myself from time to time when I see it unfolding because you've got you've got a control system and the families behind it who are seeking to crash the system. We're talking about the economic system, for instance, but many others because they want to use that in the term that I use, problem, reaction, solution, to replace the status quo with a, a much more centralized global dictatorship in finance, they want a world central bank, they want a world government, they want a world currency. But of course, to bring something radically new in, the status quo has to not be working or perceived not to be working. Um, because if it's working and they say, we're going to bring this, hold on a second, everything's fine, go and have a beer, go away, leave it alone. But if it's perceived there's a, that this is not working, then they have the opportunity to say, it's not working, look, it's a big collapse, we've got to do this, central bank, world central bank, world government, all this stuff. So on that level, the, the, the inner core of the 
global manipulation is seeking to crush it. But it's like the control system mentality is, is only at, at one, one level of awareness, and it's quite a very low level of awareness. Anyone who wants power over is suffering from desperate, desperate insecurity, and so he's not at a very high level of consciousness. The way that controls humanity, which is capable of that, um, is to hold it in a smaller box than it's in. So it's here, and it's saying, um, we're going to crash the, uh, crash the economy, we're going to do this and all that stuff, and then we're going to bring in this new world order. Yeah, because we're in control, and they're there, and they don't understand. What these don't understand is the level of awareness here, that is actually playing this out. And what's happening here, from this perspective of the control system mentality, ain't actually what's happening. Because um, while they think they're crashing it to bring in a, an even more fierce uh, replacement, what's actually happening is they're playing out a scenario of the, the, the system now crashing, and that gives us the opportunity to um, go in another direction. And what, what we need to do as fast as possible is to get people who are seeing that the world's not like they thought it was, who are seeing this blatant um, uh, corruption and lack of empathy for, for the consequences of, of, of this banking crash, where bigger bonuses are paid by, uh, to bankers who've been bailed out by the people who are having to fund the bigger bonuses and all this stuff. Um, it's that instead of um, reacting with protest and riots, um, which just give, give the control system an excuse to increase the uh, imposition of a military domestic law enforcement, um, we, we, instead of just protesting, we stop cooperating. Because the number of people in full awareness who are manipulating this seven billion people are a tiny, tiny fraction. Um, and so, so small, they have to recruit from the target population for the, inf the law enforcement and administration to enforce their agenda. So um, the power is with the people. What this, this, this control system does, and has done all through this period, is, is get the public to perceive that they have no power and the power is here. So people then give their power away. It's like the school bully. Oh, you can't, you can't take on the school bully because you get beat up. Well, I've taken on school bullies. And, and, and when you take them on and face them up, they just, they just fall apart because it's, it's all perception rather than substance. And this control system has so few people in full awareness that are doing it that when the people turn and see it and, and, and cease to cooperate with it, this is just going to disappear. Very quickly, actually, because it has no power. It, it, it's persuaded people that it has power, therefore people uh, give it power. Um, and it's important that to get across that just protesting about the way the system's falling, to prop it up and just tinker with it, like moving the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, well, you know, we should more to take uh, more from the bankers and give more to the... Well, yeah, but that's tinkering with it. It's, it's not that the system is f uh, flawed in detail, it's the system is flawed in its entirety. And, and so um, we're at this very, very, uh, well, exciting and challenging time where... Um, in theory, this could go either way. We could go further into the control system. I say we, we won't ultimately, although it might seem to like it for a few years. Or we can take this opportunity to completely um, end this, this whole um, period of uh, the few controlling the many. And what has to go in any... Uh, situation of transformation is the, is the financial system. I was watching a, um, I was watching a video today um, uh, of a, a woman talking about, uh, in detail, about interest on money. Ludicrous. It's a, it's a unit of exchange to overcome barter. It should be serving us, not enslaving us. 
and she she pointed out that um, eighty percent of the people she had very good figures and background eighty percent of the people um, pay more in their uh, lives um, because of interest about ten percent are kind of equal and 10%, just 10%, benefit by staggering amounts from the fact we have interest on, on money. And uh, she was saying that something like the price of everything is about 45% higher than it would be without interest on money. Because, of course, it's not that just that we're paying interest on loans, Everyone we buy things from is paying interest on loans, and that goes into the price of the things we buy so they can pay the loans. <laughs> so this interest on money has to go, and, um, uh, and, and, and money has to uh, take back its, its rightful place uh, as overcoming the limitations of barter as a unit of exchange. Um, and that's the kind of thinking we need, not... Should interest rates be up or interest rate? Where should interest rates be? What's the Fed doing on interest rates? That's, that's moving the bloody deck chairs. Interest has to go because interest in itself is, is, is such a force for human enslavement. Um, it's unbelievable. It's real prime. So it, yeah, in, in truth, we've developed a society that simply can't sustain itself. Yes, we have, and, and so many others have reached that point. But what has happened is, because of this consciousness thing, we've had revolutions to bring down a society that had reached the end of its um, period of, of sustainability, whether it was communism or fascism or anything, apartheid. And then you replace it, because the level of consciousness is the same, in the revolution as that which is being challenged, then you get replaced with something else. And then you go through the same process again until that reaches a point of unsustainability. And then they have another bloody revolution and it starts again. You know, I, I've been in South Africa a lot. I've got a great friend there, Kreda Mutwa, and um, apartheid may have been rightly replaced. But there's, but freedom, freedom in South Africa is 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 now um, it, it's still just a word, you know, because the white elite um, that controlled South Africa before, during apartheid has now become a black elite um, in a one-party state called the uh, uh, African National Congress, and 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 because whoever. Uh, the, the, the African National Congress wins every election because it's a one-party state. It means that whoever is elected by the hierarchy of the ANC to be president of the ANC will at the next election be the next president of the country. So we seem there again to have taken this enormous leap from white minority rule to black majority rule. And yet, you've gone from one elite to another. And ironically, the families behind apartheid are the families behind the black elite. And, and so in this period we're going through now, it's so important that we don't replace one mask with another mask at the same level of awareness. This has to be a fundamental rethink of the way we live our lives. Because if it's not, then nothing's going to change except names and pedantics. So, David, do you feel the, the internet is an outer reflection of what's actually happening on an inner spiritual level as far as a, an emerging collective planetary consciousness? Well, the, the internet is, um, is a double-edged sword because, of course, they created the internet because the authorities thought it would have benefit to them. And... Um, they was came from military technology, of course, and in one way, um, it's a very good vehicle for surveillance and, and, and everything because they know where you go. They can get a, a personality profile from you. Reading emails is a piece of cake. 
and they can store them and go and all that stuff. So it's good from that point of view. But what I do feel is that they, 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 weren't, they weren't perceiving what's happened. Um, and I, I look at my life and the information I've got out, I look at the Alex Joneses of this world and, 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 and so many other people. Without the internet, we would not, not it'd be anywhere near the level of awareness of the, the control system as we are, and, and other things too. Um, and any anything like the internet, which is which is in in, in its in its own way, is a collective reality. I I, I, I talk in my books and and, and, and like on on, on Saturday uh, about uh, the, the the in theme and some detail the amazing um, parallels between the reality we're actually experiencing and the World Wide Web. There's so many parallels and. It's interesting that you know the, the the old shaman of the past. They had to use analogies and symbolism to explain what they were trying to get across that related to the the lives that people could understand, the lives they were living, and so they had to use you know what academics would say. Oh, they're oh they're primitive. They're saying that you know all the rest of it. Like um, you know, the Zulus say the moon's an egg because they say it's been hollowed out and, and stuff like that. They just symbolism like that. Um, but we now, um, in this period, have technology, uh, the analogy of technology, that that can really get across um, very powerful symbols for what we are actually experiencing as in 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 everyday reality. And um, anything that people focus on, um, they connect to in terms of consciousness, because ultimately everything is one. And so, in its own way, the internet is already a collective mind. It's already a collective mind, uh, because every time you go online and you, you, you focus on it, you're connecting to it, not just electronically, you're connecting to it in terms of consciousness. And, and, and um, uh, so, you know, we've got the collective mind, we've got, if you like, called the individual mind, but there is this, there's this new phenomenon now, which is a, a, like a collective consciousness in itself, uh, we call the internet. And when you see um, the information on the internet and the, the way the information is, is moving and changing, you could very um, well see it as a, uh, an expression of the state of human consciousness. Because, you know, when, um, when the internet started, it was kind of just all kind of stuff you find in newspapers. And then it started to build and started to change. And now there's uh, an enormous, enormous amount of, of information um, on the internet that is awakening, um, uh, perception changing. And of course, that's happening in the collective mind. I, th I think it's a, a very good metaphor for what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think even you and I speaking right here, we're in communication, which is communion. Even two people feeds into the collective consciousness. Exactly. And when you look back in history, what the Gutenberg Press alone did to the Renaissance and the help helping people wake up, you can really see where if you get a few hundred million people constantly connecting, it might be feeding into the planetary awakening in some sense that we don't even realize at this point. Yeah, I think, you know, every, every, everything ha operates on many, many, many different levels. And so when you look at the internet and um, you see uh, how, how much there is now uh, uh, that is looking at the world in, in, in a different way, um, that is, is a reflection of the way consciousness collectively is doing it. And, you know, you, you, you kind of ask the question in a way, is, is the information on the internet changing and reflecting itself into the human collective consciousness, or is it going the other way? <laughs> that actually the human collective consciousness is reflecting itself within the, the, the if you like, the, the physical internet. And, 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 and that's expressing what's happening in, in, in the collective human mind, because um, without the internet, um, 
however, I'm not sure that we'd be anywhere near where we are now. So it's probably a two-way thing. But it, this reality that we are experiencing, what I call the, um, the cosmic internet, the cosmic wireless internet, um, it's affecting us. And it's communicating with us. And we're communicating with that. Every time we have a thought, every time we have a different spin on life, we're putting it into that uh, collective uh, reality. So it's like an interactive computer game where we're receiving information from the game, but we're also uh, putting information on the, game, uh, on the game. We're doing that with our thoughts. Now, when you look at the internet, you don't just get information from the internet. You post information on the internet. That's a, a two-way exchange of information. And in so many ways, I use this analogy so much these days because I think it's so perfect. Um, the, the, the internet um, is, is such an, um, a, a, a symbol for the, the reality that we're experiencing. And one of the things I go into more and more, as I understand it, is if you go on the internet in China, um, this great chunks of the internet you can't access because the firewall it off. I'm saying that there's great chunks of this reality that have been firewalled off that we do not connect with, that we used to connect with. And um, that, I would suggest, is why, uh, or at least one major reason why 95% of DNA is called junk DNA because they don't know what it does and vast areas of the brain don't seem to be doing anything. Um, it's because we've been uh, disconnected um, from the true reality. And I think as we go through this, this change and through our children and grandchildren, that, that expansion of what we could connect with once before the firewalls were put in um, will, be, will come back. And this will be seen, this period we're living through now, and this epoch that's passed, to be extraordinarily primitive compared with um, what, where we'll be going. Because I think we're operating on a fraction, a fraction of our potential and being systematically um, put in that position. I hope so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, we I, I hope we have a much more potential left. Oh, yeah. we, 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 we're scratching the bloody surface every day. I mean, look at our lives. You get up in the morning, you go to work. You go, I mean, we're only capable of that? No. We're incredible. So, we're starting to remember it. So David, every once in a while in life, we're faced with the realization that if we create our reality, why is it that we occasionally create something so totally unwanted in our lives? And when this happens, what kind of processing do you go through when this does happen? Well, it's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, we, we, we create our own reality, but that doesn't mean we create a reality we necessarily like. Um, for me, uh, you know, people say, um, if you create your own reality, how come we, we all see the same walls and the same picture over there? Well, that's because, um, as Einstein said, um, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. The, real, the, the reason it's persistent is the same reason as the internet on the screen of a computer is persistent when it's connected to the internet. We are, we are decoding information in the form of photons which act as a, a, a wireless internet and uh, we're decoding that information and we are experiencing it not out there as it seems that's illusory in here in the genetic structure in the brain and so we're connected to the to the cosmic world wide web so I look at that camera you look at that camera you look at that camera we're all seeing the same camera now this is where we create our reality if primarily and that's what do you think of the camera do you like the camera up do, do you like the camera did you like that picture do, do you not like that picture and this is where we start to put our spin and 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 and, and when we're faced with um, situations within this collective reality, we, from our state of perception, make decisions. And those decisions have causes and effects. And therefore, um, we start to create our own reality by our perceptions, which become our actions, which become the reaction to um, what we've done. And so, um, if, if, we, um, if we make decisions, decisions out of love and caring and all that stuff, that that's going to come back to us if we, if we make um, 
uh, decisions based on me, 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 then for a while, if you're a banker, you might become very rich, but it's going to kick back. As Martin Luther King said, um, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And it seems to me, from what I'm perceiving the world now, is in this vibrational change, the point between cause and effect is getting closer and closer and closer. Um, which means you face the consequences of your actions quicker and quicker and quicker. And what does that mean? You learn quicker and quicker and quicker if you've got any sense. And not every... See, when I look at my life, um, some of the greatest challenges and the things I've liked the least have been the greatest gifts. And uh, it's like you, you... It's like the... the, 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 the what's happening now, you can perceive it like that, oh my God, or you can perceive it like that, whoa, this is good, because this is over and we can build something better. And it's the same with um, decisions that we make, you know, the, the, the conscious mind can see the next turn on the river. Your higher levels of awareness, which this system seeks to connect, disconnect us from, can see the, the river from source to sea. So what seems to you here to be a bad thing uh, from from the conscious mind's perspective, from here, it might seem bad in the but but because of that, that's going to lead to this, which is going to be great, because we 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 don't we don't we're not what we are, despite what have happened to us. We are what we are because of what has happened to us, the things we liked and the things we didn't like, and sometimes um, we attract things to us, or all the time we attract things to us, which are basically. Uh, what I call holographic expressions of the vibrational self and we call these people girlfriends and wives and husbands and boyfriends and locations and jobs and bosses and opportunities or lack of opportunities and you know this is why I say um, if we start blaming other people for our uh, what's happening to us even though other people appear to be doing it then what we're saying is, I have no power over my life. They have. Um, but it makes people feel good because now I'm not responsible for what's happened to me. It's their fault. It's their fault. And, you know, we can, we can see situations and we can say, it's appalling what they're doing to me. Something's happening to me at the moment. It's appalling what they're trying to do to me. But um, then you say, well, okay, um, but I bet it's in my life, so I must be in some way responsible for this. Not just responsible to take the blame for it, but responsible for what is this trying to tell me? What is this trying to tell me? Because um, for me, I, I go into this in detail in the new book, and I will on Saturday, the prime level of, uh, of this universe is waveform vibrational information. That's the, that's the basis of everything. We then decode this vibrational information through the five senses into electrical information into digital and, and holographic information which becomes the world we experience so when people say um, well how can I know what's going on in here and what I need to change this vibrational level of self if I can't see it well you're seeing it because this information has not changed it's just changed its expression it's gone from the vibrational through the electrical and eventually to the holographic. So this is an expression of this. So it's what I call the language of life. What's happening here is telling you what's happening here and it tells you what you need to change here to change this. So are there patterns in your life where the same thing keeps happening? Do you keep attracting the same type of girlfriend or, or boyfriend? Do you keep uh, attracting the same problems? Um, uh, uh, what have you? Um, why is this not working? Why is it working for him and it's not working for me? Uh, and and when when we read the language of life, it's like I, I see so so many people, they through preconceived ideas they decide this this is the outcome they want. For me, outcomes are prisons, real prisons, because you say this is the outcome I want. Okay, but anything else is now a failure. And, and everything else is now, now not an option because I want this outcome. And I see people symbolically banging on doors that are locked and never going to open. And over here there's one swinging open. But you don't because you, you want the outcome. You've got a preconceived idea of the outcome. Bam, open the bloody door. It's not opening. And, and, and when you um, read that language like, this is not working. Why is this not working? This door is not opening for me. So either it's not meant to open or... I have to go about it another way. Either way, I have to change what I'm doing. And um, what, I, what changed my life 
uh, is when um, I decided that um, I wasn't going to have outcomes. I was going to flow with where life took me. Where it synchronized and where it flowed, I would go with it. Where, it, where there was blocks and, 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 and barriers, um, I was going to not go there. Because a lot of, uh, in so many ways, life can be uh, symbolized as walking through a maze. Now you can decide you're going down this channel and nothing's going to stop you because you want that outcome. And what happens? What happens? There's a, th 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 there's a, a, a big block at the end. You don't go anywhere. It's a cul-de-sac. Um, and if you follow the language of life, like, like when I look at my life over the last 20 years, it's like being walking through a maze. But some force has been saying, nope, not down there, down there. Okay, only so far, now down there. And, and what's led me through it has been intuition, not, not head, intuition. Whether it felt right, um, was there a synchronistic uh, flow here that was saying go there? Um, and instead of trying to work it out here, just let, let life flow. Because what you're connecting to when you do that is that level of all of us that can see the journey from source to sea. You get the only see the next turn in the river out the bloody way and most people are in here they're trying to work it out they want proof of everything they want to be persuaded and, and, and um, uh, convinced of everything uh, whereas if you if you just flow with life is it working is it flowing okay well I'm going with this if it's not well I'll go with where it does flow and and that will take you through the door that's swinging open instead of you, your mind saying, no, I want to do this, I want this outcome. I, I have no outcome, I have, I have no outcome in my mind um, of, of, of where I want to go. I just know I'm going to go with the flow tomorrow, you know, and, and that's the end of it. And, and it makes life so much easier, because instead of you opening doors, doors open for you. Why? Because you meant to go through them, you know. Um, and, and outcomes are, um, are real um, they're real prisons, you know. I, I was talking to Credo Mutwood in South Africa last August and he was going through a real period of retrospection because he's coming up to his 90th year. When he became a, a, a high shaman, his job was to um, keep the information and pass it on and to serve his people and look after his people. That was it, right? So over this period of his life, of course, there's been tremendous changes in South Africa. And, you know, while people in places like America have had the ability to go through this um, process of f following the material dream and finding it wanting, a lot of developing countries, they haven't had that uh, ability because they haven't had a material dream. And but so to them, it's still the symbol of success because, I mean, everything's telling Hollywood and all the things they get telling them that and so a lot of people in those countries like South Africa they've turned away from the old ways because it's the Nike trainers and stuff and and that's made it more and more difficult for people like Credo and he's, he's, he's looking at it in retrospect and he's saying I'm a failure I've failed my people I've failed you know and I said to him look you if you think of outcomes then you might think failure but it's not about outcomes. Every single day, coming up to his 90th year with um, tremendous health problems, and he's getting more and more frail, um, he gets up every day and says, what do I do for my people? How can I help my people? He's kind of building a hospital for AIDS patients and uh, um, abused children behind his house. He's coming up to 90. So the outcome doesn't just depend on us like that. It depends on whether people want to know, and lots of them don't. But that's not Kratos' fault, because he's done his best. And so at the end of his life, his life's a massive success, because he's done what he knew to be right all the way through it, even though on an on a outcome level he might have said, well, you know, I failed. He hasn't. Um, and and once, you, once you create outcomes, you're setting yourself up for failure. You go to a football match. Um, you 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 you're really focused on an outcome. My team must win. Uh, 
any other any other result, you've had a bad day. You go to the you go to the football match and you think I'm going to enjoy the game. I'd like that team to win, but that, I'm not really totally fussed on it. And I, the other team's got skill as well. Hey, you see how he's throwing that ball? Look at that guy. And 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 whether you win, lose, or draw your team, you're still had a good day because you're not focused and and controlled by outcomes. And, and if you look at it. Um, all the time, right through school, all over the world, kids are told to have an outcome. What's your ambition? What do you want to be? And it's all right to have those things, but we need to be more fluid about let life lead us because, you know, that level of us that made the decision to come into this reality in the situation we came into it, um, is the kind of expanded consciousness that near-death experiences um, uh, experience when suddenly from being like that they go woo they're they're perceiving multiple levels at the same time there is no time there is no space hey everything's one all this stuff uh, that's the level that decides then the the level that's experiencing directly then has to work out why it would decide to come in here and um, it can uh, it can get completely lost by outcomes, by being programmed from an early age. You must have ambition. What's your outcome? And your parents, I'd like you to be a banker because it would be good for me because then I can say my son's a banker and all this stuff. And, and, and those conscious mind programmed outcomes can and do in most people, disconnect you from this flow, from that level that, that, that made the decision to come in here, that is wants to take you on a journey. And uh, that's why when you break out of um, mind-dominated decision-making, life starts to become more of an adventure instead of a trudge. And you might not, not make as much money as you would sitting in an office in San Francisco from, I don't know, eight to five or six every day. Um, when you know what you're going to be doing next week and next Tuesday and next Wednesday at four o'clock, then if you go with the flow and, and life's an adventure. You know. I was a television presenter. I, um, I went into the BBC. I did my programs. I went home. Then the top of my head blew off. And I went on this adventure, and, and um, I, I've just had the most incredible 20 years. Not all of it nice, but all of it incredible. Because um, the source to see is guiding me, not the next turn on the river. And that's what the, that, that is what the transformation's about, moving from that state to that state. Because then we're in the world, but we're not of it. Most people are in the world and of it, and that's why they're lost. They've got no roadmap, no radar. So David, if I could put a, a magic microphone in front of you and you had 30 seconds to talk to every single person on the planet and you could speak from your heart, really from presence, what would you consider the most valuable information to give everybody on the planet all at once? Remember who you are. Remember who you are. Because what I'm saying, what other people are saying, is nothing that everyone listening anywhere doesn't already know. We've just forgotten because we're in an amnesic state. Remember who you are. The world will be transformed. Remember that the free, independent media is our last stand against the invisible enslavement and tyranny that lies before us if we're not careful. You've been listening to the Spiritual Activist Radio Show that is a community-supported, non-profit endeavor, and you can make a tax-deductible donation at www.spiritualactivist.com and find out more about me, Rahasi Uncensored, and how you can be part of helping to wake up the world.